Has the red button started? It has it on my end. I have it on my end. I see the record on the top uh, left corner on my end. Okay. All right. We'll jump into it. There it is on my end. It just hit. Okay. Welcome okay. again, ladies and gentlemen, to the philosophy of art and science. As always, if you support this programming, you can either join the YouTube channel directly at various levels, or you could head over to patreon.com slash Aksum. That's P-A-T-R-E-O-N dot com slash A-K-S-U-M. Today, our guest with us is Savdikan Mina. How are you doing today? I'm doing good. Thank you. Thank you for having me. Of course. My pleasure. There are an, a number of topics that we can delve into, and I think I'll try to see if we have, um, you know, a logical way to get there. But if we don't cover everything, that's fine, too. Um, we had a little bit of a, we we're the beginning of a spirited conversation even before the recording. So I wanted to make sure that the people get to hear our conversations and uh, we do have a spicy topic, at least one spicy topic for our uh, people near the equator. But uh, before we get into that, I know that, you, you know, not everyone who's on the show knows what the show is there are some people who do know the show and it's always great and sometimes i um you know i'm always corralling guests i'm always asking people to come on and some people are very gung-ho and some people are very hesitant and they're like well let me study it i don't know if i you know want to be associated with it they don't know what it is <laughs> and even my name is kind of vague um, i had one church father he asked me one time he said is it a religion show or what is it? I said, it's everything. And he was kind of confused about it because, you know, my two most recent episodes are very religious oriented. I'm sure we'll get into religion with you. But another one could be politics. Another one could be language. Another one could be anything. I, I'm wondering what was it that uh, first, because I don't know, what first kind of drew you to the philosophy of art and, and science? And when did you kind of uh, start to become a regular? I... Uh... I'm a subscriber also to the YouTube channel, or the, um, uh, what's, it, what's the name, Mr. Trulia, um, the Orthodox. Uh, yeah, Craig Trulia. Yeah, theology, yeah, yeah. Craig Trulia, yeah. So when he interviewed you and that you said that you had a channel, I was like, this is a, you know, an Ethiopian Orthodox deacon who has a YouTube channel. I got to support my Oriental Orthodox uh, brothers out there. So, um, and then when I, and, you know, I listen to what you, you know, what you have. It's not just religion. I understand you speak about politics, about culture, um, uh, certain things about art that kind of go, you know, way over my head. But I like the fact that you're open to speaking about many things and how it's relevant to our lives. Um, I can talk about politics. I can talk about culture as, as, as far as I'm, you know, aware of it in my um in my lifetime and and yeah i'm also being on religious discussion i also listen to some of your like your commentary on, on the book of romans as well you know whenever i drive I, I just like to like you know put in a youtube list and uh, you're like one of the channels that i subscribe to and i listen to so shukran shukran <laughs> uh, <laughs> um that's no that's good so it's funny that you said that someone else had mentioned that Craig interview actually just this week I had a deacon, another Ethiopian deacon friend of mine call and uh, bounce kind of ideas on, off me that, that he has and a project that he has. And I always encourage people, it's so great that you're using that time because sometimes people just want to listen to music and zone out. And there are times where I listen to music as well, or there are times mm -hmm. where I'm, I'm, I have quite a commute. When I have a commute, I'll, I'll sometimes turn the the music off actually i was at a, a servant or for people who don't know the language a kind of a sunday school teachers seminar hosted by um uh, the coptic church in, in los angeles mainly it was people from the saint mark's community which is the first church and then some of those people who branched off and made holy resurrection which is kind of the the english-speaking ministry and um, there was this gentleman, Uncle Victor, uh, he, he taught and led the seminar. I remember one of the things that he changed about my way of life was that he encouraged people to either listen to like the psalmody on their way to church or to listen to nothing. 
and it might be so obvious to you, but I remember, you know, being younger and, and coming across so many other people where like on the road to church, they get hyped up with different types of secular music. And it, mm-hmm. <laughs> it just, uh, I don't think it sets the mood in the right way. So. No, I absolutely agree with that. Yeah. No, I've also at a certain point in my life, whenever I'm going to liturgy or, uh, or vespers if if i'm on my way to pray i need to get myself in a certain mood so i could i would listen to maybe like a sermon or or some hymns um just so i can be you know in a mindset of being prepared for the church and not yeah not secular music secular music i can also listen to sometimes um but when it's when i'm on my way to church i have to put myself in that mindset yeah and that and that's a i think a, a good kind of segue to get into it so you are a subdeacon in the church as i understand it the coptic rite has or the alexandrian rite has preserved the various levels of the diaconate in a way that frankly the the giz rite or the ethiopian church that does not like we have 10 year olds who become archdeacon so could you talk mm-hmm. to us a little bit about your path to becoming, you know, subdeacon? Like, were your parents religious and they brought you into it and then you got into it or is something on your own? Like, what? how did you get to be a subdeacon? So you don't you don't just become subdeacon overnight, of course. Um, you have to start uh, from somewhere. And you, in my, in my time, when I was six years old, I started as a chanter uh, in our church. Um, and my, uh, grandfather, um, God rest his soul was a priest. Mm-hmm. He was a priest of St. Uh, George and St. Judah church in Jersey city, New Jersey. Uh, oh, father, yeah, yeah. Uh, father Antonio Sraga. Um, and he, uh, you know, and, and through that, you know, our family were brought up obviously very young to become very religious. And, um, but your, so, or your father was not made a priest or your mother was not, you know, <laughs> obviously, you know, no, right. no, no, they, they, uh, they're both, uh, no, they, they're, they're both until today. Uh, they're still, um, yeah. Uh, I mean, my dad had, I, he says that he was, he was a, a reader. He was ordained a reader when he was young, but nothing higher than that. Um, but both of them are physicians. So it, in the Coptic Church, it is kind of a joke that that's that's a uh, ordained ministry in its own right. <laughs> yeah, is this the throne of Mark or the throne of Luke? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, right. <laughs> so that's uh, so that that's um, one of the big, I guess, prestiges in our church is that when you're a doctor, oh, you're someone someone very important to the church. And on top of that, that the fact that you're religious is also a big deal. At Is some point, your grandfather, a physician and a priest, because I've heard some of them are like physicians and engineers, and they quit to become a priest. No, my grandfather was an engineer, so he was um, he he was a, a from what I understand, very big time engineer uh, in Egypt. He also went to Germany and got some training there as well before coming back, um, and was involved in the railroad projects. But uh, part of his uh, time is that he also put a lot of energy into service in the church and was part of the Sunday school movement that was started by St. Habib Girgis. Um, and uh, that was, there was a story where my grandfather used to attend, attend his uh, sermons um, and get a lot of uh, inspiration from him. And then he was like one of the founding people of this, you know, he continued to increase the Sunday school movement in the uh, Church of St. Antonios in uh, Shubra, uh, Cairo, Egypt. And that's actually been um, documented by uh, Otto Minardos when he writes um, the uh, book on the Coptic civilization. Um, and there's an area there where he mentions my grandfather's name before he was a priest. His name was Labib Rehab. So, uh, so um, wow. that was... So in, 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 in a way, he had a huge engineering job, and then he also was super involved in the service of the church. And then Pope Shenouda, when he first became pope, um, he wanted my grandfather to be one of the first people that he would ordain a, a presbyter. So, uh, and then ever since then, um, 
you know, he uh, he served in a church in St. George in Giyushi, uh, uh Cairo, Egypt. But after a year, I think he was, uh, he went and traveled with the Pope to meet Jimmy Carter. So he was one of the, uh, uh, one of the priests there with Pope Shenouda to, uh, and it was considered the first Coptic Pope to ever visit the United States. And so he, uh, Pope Shenouda liked my grandfather to come with him. And um, eventually, a couple of years later, he took care of a church in uh, St. Paul, Minnesota. And when my mom was about eight months pregnant, she left Egypt and went to the United States and then gave birth to me in Minnesota. I know nothing about Minnesota. <laughs> <laughs> I know I think, a little bit about it. I lived in North Dakota and visited there often. Yeah. Uh, later on, I think when I was a few months old, uh, they moved to uh, Jersey City, New Jersey. And then uh, my grandfather, you know, stayed there and became uh, the priest there. And so you and, and you and you were raised around in that environment. So it, it kind of makes sense that they put you in there as a chanter to kind of make you religious. What are the, the the duties of a chanter? As I understand, it's you know you there's a special uh, cassock or dress that you're given, and you're you're to study the liturgy. Is is that is that it? Or yeah, are you are different? you are pretty much to study the the hymns of the church, um, and uh, you know pretty much when you you have to you have to be really good at uh chanting the hymns now in our church the chanter is also there to kind of encourage young male uh um, participation in the liturgy so it's sort of like uh, at, you know when i grew up it was kind of like a rite of passage for almost all young males um would there but, be any that are like i don't know if they see adhd or they're too troublesome that they just wouldn't or what you know what would be the criteria for the few males that wouldn't be there's kind of no criteria for a chanter it's just being a young male boy that they that that they can uh um consecrate in the church now i know in california they're also starting to have female chanters too um so i have seen that and sometimes yeah. people say female deacons yeah yeah, they're not deacons in the strict sense. We once you actually do wear the white garb, uh, uh, they call you a shemes, which literally means deacon, um, even as a chanter. But it's a, uh, uh, you know, it's um, it's a misnomer. You know, when you when you grow grow much older, you, you realize you're not a shemes in the full sense of the word. Um, but yeah, I uh, I eventually. Um, you know, well, well, let's stay, let's stay there a little. Were, and where you were chanting growing up as now a third or second generation American, depending on how you count it, were you chanting in English at all? Or was it all Coptic or was it Coptic and Arabic? Or what was the ratios if you could give them? I mean, I it definitely mainly Coptic, um, and English, but I can, I also know to chant, uh, some Arabic, uh, phrases as well some Arabic hymns. Um, so uh, it all depends on the environment that I grew up. Like for instance, we, uh, uh, there, are, there are certain hymns during the liturgy that you say um, uh, in Arabic, like Ifrahi Amariam, Rejoice, O Mary, um, and Ayyuh um, Rab, uh, I'm trying to remember, is it the Adam? Uh, it's, it's right, I'm trying to remember where it is. It's it's right before we start to say the um, uh, holy, 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 oh, um, oh Lord. I I'm, I'm drawing a blank, but anyway, the, those no two. Worries. I've also heard is it. I'm going to butcher it. Ya Raburha, the Lord have mercy, alongside the Kyrie eleison. Yeah, yeah, that's those are kind of easy to remember. Um, only because they're smaller phrases. Um, and then uh, as you grow older as a chanter, you can start to serve a little bit in the altar and try to learn some of the 
uh, alter responses as well. So that's something that we've been learning. And I and the uh, priest that I owe a lot to my learning um, was Father uh, Daoud Bebewi of the same parish, St. George's Nation of Injury City, New Jersey. Um, or you can also search him on YouTube or on Google as Father David Bebewi. He, he can go as Daoud or David. Um, he has a very soprano voice. Um, you would definitely enjoy listening to a liturgy with him. So uh, you, you started leveling up, learning the, the liturgy from him, and is the next level reader before subdeacon? Is that right? Yes. So I was a reader when I was about 18 years old, I believe. I was in St. Mary's uh, uh, Coptic Church in East Brunswick, New Jersey. Um, and at that time, uh, uh, Father, the head priest, Father Beshoy, um, uh, recommended me to the bishop, and the bishop uh, yeah, uh, or, um, consecrated me, and he gave me the name Michael. I think the reason was there's two people in front of me. He asked their names, and both their names were Michael. And then he just kept going on, Michael, 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 and did not ask my name. <laughs> <laughs> like the Agios, 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 Michael, Michael, Michael. Yeah. <laughs> like, I consecrate you, Michael, reader of uh, St. Mary's Orthodox Church in East Brunswick, New Jersey. <laughs> and he uh, tonsured me, cut my hair as well at that time. And then in 2016, um, my uh, father confessor, Father Abraham Wasif in uh, – St. Mina's Church in Homedale, New Jersey, uh, recommended that I become subdeacon. And uh, I went, and then Bishop Karras, who's now Bishop of Pennsylvania and, and Ohio, was the one who ordained me subdeacon that day. And what are the differences between your duties as a reader versus subdeacon? And uh, how did an 18 year old feel to get his hair cut off? <laughs> um, when I was a reader, I definitely did have like nice long curls. So it was interesting to get my hair cut off. Um, but I was starting, I was finishing you didn't up. Rebel against what? No, I didn't rebel. I was like, I, I'm obedient. <laughs> um, but I was, um, uh, I was starting to finish my servants prep courses in, um, uh, in East Brunswick. So I think there was a sense of when I, when I start to become a Sunday school teacher, that's, you know, that's when you can have a certain reader status and a reader pretty much, uh, technically is somebody who, when he reads the epistles, um, re reads it in such a way as he's teaching, um, the congregation. So you have to take a teaching status, so to speak. Uh, and that is, uh, uh, you know, among other things, you know, make sure you keep the fasts, uh, and, uh, and the canons of the church. Um, but yeah, that's, that's the big, big idea behind the reader, uh, or a lector is that you're able to teach. And, and do that, you have, for clarity's sake, women at the reader's role in the Coptic church, uh, in your experience? No, no, we don't. Um, um. I don't want to say fortunately, unfortunately, it's just that we don't have that. I think that only exists probably in convents, um, but not uh, in a uh, open uh, atmosphere uh, among the general people. I think the only thing that, that, uh, that are given to women are chanters, and even that became such a huge controversy in our church. Um, so, so, no, we don't. Uh, rarely, if any, we have any readers, uh, female readers. And then the differentiation, once you've achieved this, you've unlocked this uh, status of being a teacher, does the subdeacon begin to carry the chalice with a goblet or something like that? No. So uh, rarely, uh, from what I understand, like when I read, it's if only in a, an emergency case, I guess can one carry it, but almost always you're not allowed to even touch the chalice. Um, only the deacon 
is allowed. And they usually show that when the deacon is ordained, he, he holds the, uh, the spoon uh, of the chalice in his hand. So, uh, so that's the only thing. But the subdeacon, according to the ancient canons of the church, technically the chanter and the reader is not even allowed to go on the altar. But the subdeacon is by the permission of the deacon. But because we want, I guess, by participation points, we also <laughs> put in chanters and readers in the altar as well. Um, and then I've understood that the subdeacon in ancient times is supposed to keep animals and heretics outside of the church, especially. <laughs> and, um, and then anybody and anybody who is a catechumen should also, you know, the subdeacon's job is to take them outside the church after the gospel. Uh, of course, we don't, you know, there's never any animal that's even allowed inside to begin with. <laughs> <laughs> it's a very funny difference in the yeah. in the rural Ethiopian church. I have heard many cases, sometimes of dogs, but you know, sometimes a goat, even in yeah. the inner sanctuary. And they have this point of view that like God wanted them there. So you know, obviously, it'd be a nightmare if they had released their fecal matter in that. Oh, you know, but but they have this view almost that like the animal is coming to worship God. So. I've heard several cases. I've never heard of any rule uh, the way you described it, but I've heard several cases where they just say, leave the animal be. And uh, it's funny that there's a specific canon against it. And uh, I want to get back to, you know, comparison, because I think comparison is so fascinating. One of the things I always tell people, because people have this narrow view of what Orthodox means. What I've seen is when you receive the blood at, when I was at a Coptic parish, they told me you're not supposed to cover your mouth. And in the Ethiopian church, if you don't cover your mouth, it's seen as rude. And so you have two, as, as I can see, antagonistic traditions that come yeah. from the very same tradition, and yet both are orthodox. And so if we believe either covering our mouth or not covering our mouth is the most orthodox thing, we, we might get in trouble. And I think this helps for the, the discussion we're going to have later is that sometimes people build pieties off of lowercase t traditions and try mm -hmm. to turn them into larger t traditions. But that that's very fascinating. Are there any parishes that enforce these ancient canons that you've seen? No, not not that I know of. And if if anything, like in Egypt itself, like when you go to a parish, it's very common to hear birds chirping right above you when you're when you're in liturgy. Um, so you know, knock on wood, I've never seen a case where there's like bird droppings in the altar, but, uh, but it's, uh, but I wonder if a subdeacon's job was to get animals out, what would, what would the case of a, of a bird be? <laughs> yeah, especially um, in our tradition, they say that the hymns of St. Yared, the Aksumite, he heard birds chirping and that's how he developed it. And then, you know, it's transported to heaven and here's the angels. So it's some combination of the angels and the birds. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And uh, just to, uh, you know, um, come off the, uh, the understanding of, you know, the small T traditions versus the big T traditions, you know, even the amount of pride that I grew up in understanding the Coptic church, a lot of people grow up thinking that the Coptic church is the only true church. And oh yeah, the Ethiopians I heard, they're also sister churches, so they're true too. But they, they, they develop this understanding that um, the other churches, even though they're Orthodox Orient, even Oriental Orthodox, they seem to be more liberal uh, Orthodox than a true Orthodox, so to speak. So um, many people would uh, be quite shocked, for instance, at the Armenian use of unleavened bread um, as opposed to our use of leavened bread. Uh, and and I, I, you know, whenever I started to, you know, get myself outside the bubble of just Coptic and see the diversity and the, and the beauty of the riches of the history of the Oriental Orthodox Church, um, I started to see, no, there is a, uh, you know that's just a small tea tradition and you know i i try i sometimes even shock people to tell them you know don't you know armenians are just as much 
right to have unleavened bread as we are with leavened bread. <laughs> so. Yeah, it's um, I see the book of Galatians everywhere. And the thing that people can't swallow about Galatians is that sometimes, you know, the American Christian will see Galatians and think Paul is the preacher of uncircumcision. But if you go back to Acts, you see he has Titus and Timothy, yeah. and he makes the one circumcised and the one uncircumcised, and he makes the circumcised eat at the same table with the uncircumcised. So mm -hmm. you can make the one with the leavened bread and the one with the unleavened bread sit exactly. at the same table. That's the kinonia. That's the the table fellowship that's that's meant to be. So I'm I'm so glad to to hear you say that is that the same thing in the view of the syriac church because i'll tell you one of the things i'm impressed with the coptic liturgy is the way and i think that's just so necessary i don't know why we don't do it but the way that they call out the other patriarchs so there's a recording i have from uh, father cyril gorgi who i appreciate he leads holy resurrection in english parish in los angeles that i've visited several times and it's his uh, liturgy recording is on itunes so it's very available for people but in that one particular, it shouts out the uh, uh, Pope Theodoros II. Mm -hmm. And uh, this name, by the way, is very common. And uh, we have a king named Theodoros II that we like a lot. So it's very, it's a very easy name for us, um, Theodore. And uh, then he says his partner in the liturgy, and he, he speaks of Mormoran. Um, I think it's uh, Ignatius, and they're the Syriac yes. patriarch. And then they even add the Eritrean patriarch, and there was a lot more controversy about that. And and now he's recently fallen asleep with the Lord. So I don't know if that practice has changed and, and what's going on. But um, I, I'd never heard the Armenian one um, or, or the Ethiopian one, and, and that probably has to do with sort of disputes. But I liked that practice. Is there an equality viewed between the sea of uh, mark in alexandria and the sea of of paul and, and peter in antioch um well yeah i i don't think one sees them like our church sees ourselves above the other and i and from what i understand even when the coptic church when when pope shenouda used to have annual meetings with the syrian patriarchate and the armenian uh, catholicos at Karakin, um that at um at in there they consider themselves as equals three equal patriarchates um representing most of oriental orthodoxy um but to to, to get back at the um, the names yeah i i don't i don't quite understand why we don't say the armenian catholicos um and you know, I've seen some parishes, especially after Pope Shenouda made peace with um, uh, his beatitude, uh, Abun uh, Petros, right? Yeah, and uh, and and some parishes started to say to add the Ethiopian patriarch to the list in their liturgies, but uh, I feel like most people got so used to just saying the two names that they just it's easier for them to just say it. I don't think it has anything to do with controversy as it is just uh, some sort of convenience. Uh, so I'm not, I'm not sure why the Syriac Patriarch is mentioned. And I think recently the, the Eritrean Patriarch, of course, now that we don't say his name because he, he passed in the Lord. Um, and I'm not sure if, do they, does the Eritrean church now recognize somebody uh, if they're in a sticky situation, um, they had like about a five-way split that a friend of mine explained to me one time. They had um, one who was under house arrest, who was the original uh, patriarch, who was yeah. the one being recognized by the Copts. Then they had another one who was appointed and then he fell asleep with the Lord. Then they said they weren't going to appoint another one. Then they appointed another one just very recently in the past year. And there were several Eritreans protesting that. Mm -hmm. um, so there was that group. There was another group, which was uh, a bishop. I think his name is uh, Abuna Makarios uh, or Makarios, who's under the Coptic Synod. And he became a bishop through the Coptic Synod. He was just a monk before that, a monk priest before that. Yeah. Uh, 
and and I know I know uh, Ember Macarius. Yeah, so he's I believe officially in the Coptics in the Synod of Alexandria, but he was a sort of metropolitan to harken back to the old days of what used to happen under the patriarch who was under house arrest. And there's a total another bishop. <laughs> uh, um, I believe his name is actually Shenouda, uh, funny yeah. enough. And he is kind of an independent entity who didn't want to recognize the new patriarch in Eritrea uh, that is, you know, uh, friendly with the regime. And yet he thought of uh, Abu Namukarios as a, you know, a heretic or something like that, or soft on certain church rules as, you know, the same thing, like uh, certain local practices. The, he seemed more Egyptian than Eritrean to him, you know, so yeah. certain things like that. So they they had a several way split. The issue now is you can't have a bishop standing alone. So uh, whether they like it or not, there's there's one synod in Eritrea and you you either recognize that or you recognize the Coptic one or the Ethiopian one or or you become a Protestant. I mean, you don't you don't have any more options before when there were two competing. You could say it's kind of debatable. And you could kind of pick a side or say you'll wait it out. But now, I mean, they have one synod. So there's, you, you don't have a lot of uh, leeway. Yeah, it's, and it's very sad how, how split things have become. Um, you know, but God, I always found it nice that they would say, and his partner in the liturgy. And they, they would say that the patriarch. And it was it was just the inclusion of it because I don't hear that in the Ethiopian liturgy we just have our patriarch. We have when we when we do the Oriental Orthodox liturgy, the annual one together, we have a list of names to to say. So you know we will say all the patriarchs' names, and then the bishops that are there too will commemorate their names as well. Can you talk um, about that? Is that is that the meeting in the tri-state area? I think I've seen pictures before, but I've never. Yes. Seen it. So we've had like you know in our in our area, New Jersey and New York, they, they like to do. Um, I mean, I'm not sure if they're going to do. I hope they do one this year, because uh, COVID kind of slowed the, things down. But the uh, but every year they would have a liturgy, and there would be a different host church. So you know, one year is the Coptic, one year the Eritrean, one year the Ethiopian, one year the Armenian, one year the Syrian. Or the Malankara, um, the uh, and so that's that has been. Uh, they they do mention the names of the patriarchs. The only exception, on, unfortunately, and I will I'll openly say, unfortunately, is that they don't mention the Malankara Orthodox as a respect to the Syrian Orthodox that's there. Um, and I hope one day that that schism is healed. Yeah, um, that's, I need to get someone on from the Indian Church to talk about that. I've heard a few things about that. That the is it the Jacobites are the ones under the Syrians directly, whereas the Malankara are under themselves. Something well, to the, the nomenclature is interesting. They are the the ones under the Syrians will call themselves Malankara Syrian Orthodox Church, and then the ones that are independent are Malankara Orthodox Syrian Church. Man, that's confusing. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> I I was talking to uh, a Lebanese coworker recently, and she's a Maronite, and so I was trying to, you know, place where that was because they have usage of Aramaic or Syriac in their liturgy, and if you just listed all the people who have Aramaic and Syriac in their liturgy, all who are somehow associated with Antioch. It's a crazy list of like three different groups under the Catholic Church, one group in communion with us, and then another group, which is the Assyrian Church of the East. And they all have the same sort of linguistic right tradition. So you know that at one point they were all together, but some of them are in the so-called Nestorian Church or the Assyrian Church of the East. Some are in our communion and some are in the Catholic Church. And the ones that are in the Catholic Church, sometimes the way they joined the Catholic Church was centuries apart. And I think part of that is the uh, the expansion and the contraction of empires in that region throughout yeah. that time. As I understand the Indian situation, it has something to do with uh, some of the laws in the nation of, of India and, and how that corresponds to 
the, the ownership of certain church properties and, and things like that's that's what I have heard and I've I've seen similar things with the Ethiopian church not in Ethiopia because in Ethiopia there's only one but the Ethiopian church in the diaspora in America certain mm -hmm. issues like that have arisen especially when certain parishes would um, they would constitute the constitution of their church mm -hmm. uh, the sort of uh, the the ethos of the Protestant church legally. Oh, wow. but in, you know, in name, and by that I mean, you know, the end all be all is like a, a parish council of the laity rather than the priests. Mm -hmm. <laughs> uh, and uh, so it's a sort of uh, a nominal orthodoxy, a, a hat tip to the church back home, but the certain parishes want to assert their property rights over, <laughs> over and against not only the local priest, but the bishops and the entire synod. Yikes. So um, yeah, I pray those those types of things don't happen. But while we're uh, we'll, we're delving into this, um, let's go back a little and and get by, what we. By yeah, the way, I, I just don't want uh, the uh, the Malankara Orthodox or the Indian Orthodox to get me wrong. You know, officially, we still can't take communion in their church. When that when just the whole church has come together, we just don't commemorate their patriarch. That's all. Out of respect to the the other patriarch, right? Yeah. Yeah. It, yeah, I mean, yeah, it, part of the titles of Antioch and Alexandria, every, everyone has to acknowledge that Alexandria and Antioch are where the apostolic sees began in our communion, and I always do. It's just a matter of at what point in the history did they gain independence? The Armenians uh, b began with Antioch, but very early on kind of got their independence. Ethiopia, I would say, had its de facto independence very early, but did not get it de jure or in, in writing until mm -hmm. the mid-1900s. And so um, there has to be an acknowledgement of the two originals. And I remember in the original titles, the Antioch is always said, end of all the East. And the uh, the Pope of Alexandria was, end all of Africa. Of Africa, yeah. <laughs> Those are <laughs> giant titles <laughs> to fulfill. All of Africa, except parts of North Africa, though, unfortunately, that went with the Latin church. <laughs> yeah, and even within Alexandria, the ones that went to the Greek church. Yeah. Like, there's um, there's this beautiful uh, monastery in the Sinai Peninsula that mm -hmm. I have seen uh, beautiful manuscripts from. St. Catherine's. Ones. Uh, what is it called? St. Catherine's, right? Yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah, yeah right. And it's in the Greek communion, if I'm not mistaken. Yep, and that's where the burning bush is. Wow. Yeah, I uh, I actually I forgot how old I was. I think I was like 16 when we actually uh, hiked up the mountain um, and then went back down and then took photos right by the burning bush. Uh, it was nice. It was very memorable. Hope hope to go in, uh, again someday. Yeah, it's amazing, an amazing um, history, especially... Um... I think more than other traditions, the Copts have surprised me. Um, I, I went to the Midnight Praises one time, and there was this line that I heard chanted that I always forever remembered after, which was like, thanking and glorifying God for burying Pharaoh and his chariots. Oh, and yeah. A bunch of Egyptians saying it, and I said, what other people would say that about their own king? <laughs> it's because they've chosen a different king, but you know it's it's Exodus 15 that they're chosen. yes, yeah. We we chant that every every um, midnight praise, every psalmody. <laughs> yeah, has a very. If you listen to the the, the chanting, so it has a very like soldier style of chant, especially if you uh, if you raise your voice on it. If you if you could uh, give us any sample of of that or any other chant, I would. Uh, my listeners, I'm sure, would be blessed. I'll have to. Let me pull it out. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> That's another great uh, segue as you're pulling that up is that I have seen that there's a sort of standardized a standardized app that a lot of cops use. So if you could talk also about that app and how it got adopted. I imagine when you were a kid, it was not in, in usage. Uh, but now it seems everywhere. And I've seen people use iPads and iPhones to pull it out. Yeah, we're uh, we're very we're very technologically uh, advanced, to, even to the point of putting projector screens inside our uh, church, which is um, a, sort of a mild controversy because uh, it tends to block the iconostasis mm -hmm. and the beauty of the church, um, and can also be um, 
distracting, but at the same time for people who you know come and visit to the church, it can also be an evangelical tool. My parish in Los Angeles was, I think, in the 90s, if not the early 2000s, the very first Ethiopian parish to ever use that. And the first thing that people said was they turned the church into a cinema. And uh, uh, within a few short years, everyone, even back home in Ethiopia, besides, you know, some of the rural monasteries and things, adopted it. Yeah. Uh, it, it, it's amazing. how now, now it's become very standard, very standard in our church. Yeah. It, the blocking of... Uh, uh, certain icons was a issue. So at my parish, again, uh, innovative parish, what they did recently was they got rid of the projector for, uh, we still have it and we still use it for some things, but we don't use it for the liturgy. And they installed two TVs on each side of mm -hmm. the main opening of the sanctuary, the inner sanctuary. And so they're smaller screens now. And so you can see in Giz and Amharic and in English, the liturgy. And it was very helpful for me about a decade ago when I started to take the church seriously because i knew zero is at the time and i've learned a lot since and my amharic was it was okay for a diaspora born person but it uh it blossomed because i read the liturgy in its entirety in amharic and then i moved on to giz and uh mm -hmm. i i i imposed upon myself a self-rule that during the liturgy i only study in giz and amharic and at home i studied in english and so that kind of triple study that was allowed by the projector first and then getting my liturgy books on the side that that helps. That's good. Yeah. And I've noticed one Syrian parish in North Jersey also started to use um, projector as well. And uh, now I think when new Coptic parishes are being built, they're, they're they're, they've been, now been using the TVs and try not to block the beauty of the um, iconostasis. Um, I, you know, I, I sympathize with both sides of the debate. Uh, when it comes to uh, when it comes to using use of projector screens, but it seems to me that it's it helps more than it harms. Uh, kind of like you know now we also use microphones in church. Sure, I, I I wonder what the first parish that ever used a microphone how people felt about that. <laughs> we so. had a deacon at my parish who grew up without a microphone, and he's mm -hmm. so loud that sometimes when he'd get the microphone people in the parish and the audience they would they would say don't give him an and and to be honest he didn't like it and and he felt a little self-conscious because people would say that too so sometimes if they force him to hold the microphone he'll hold it like three feet away from his his mouth but really he just sort of holds one ear and he belches and uh i always thought it was great because i learned a lot from him because of that and there's a me and a couple other deacons too we joked about that you'd have to have a smaller parish my parish is about 300 to 500 people so you'd have to have like a parish of 50 i think but if you could have a parish of 50 or less i think it's it'd be manageable even in 2022 to not have a microphone absolutely there was one point in my parish i believe it was in uh, an easter liturgy where the electricity got cut off and um we ended up raising our voices to, for the people to hear. And there's a certain uh, solemnity that comes with that, um, I think, uh, that maybe we've missed a little. Uh, so, but I agree with you. You know, when you have a full parish, still you need to. Um, we have extremely high ceilings too. So I think, uh, you know, those sort of cave churches that we might have uh, back in Africa with the lower ceilings so allow for more reverberation and, and echoing and and that yeah. would be very beautiful that would be so I, I pulled it up here so it's the first canticle uh exodus 15. uh I'll, I'll i'll sing i'll chant a few parts then moses and the children of israel sang to the lord and spoke saying let us sing to the lord for he has triumphed gloriously the horse and its rider he has thrown into the sea. The Lord is my strength and song, and he has become my salvation. He is my God, and I will glorify him, my Father's God, and I will exalt him. The Lord is a man of war. The Lord is his name, Pharaoh's chariots, and his army he has cast into the sea. His chosen captains also drowned in the Red Sea. The depths have covered them. They sank to the bottom like a stone, like a stone. 
Your right hand, O Lord, has become glorious in power. Your right hand, O Lord, has dashed the enemy in pieces. And in the greatness of your excellence, you have overthrown those who rose against you. You have sent forth your wrath. It consumed them like stubble. And with the blast of your nostrils, the waters were gathered together. The flood stood upright like a heap, and the depths congealed in the heart of the sea. The enemy said, I will pursue, I will overtake, I will divide the spoil. My desires shall be satisfied on them. I will draw my sword, and my hand shall destroy them. You blew with your wind, the sea covered them. They sank like lead in the mighty waters. Who is like you, O Lord, among the gods? Who is like you, glorified in his saints? Amazing in glory, performing wonders. You stretched out your right hand. The earth swallowed them. You, in your mercy, have led forth the people whom you have redeemed. You have guided them in your strength to your holy habitation. The people will hear and be afraid. Sorrow will take hold of the inhabitants of Palestine. Then the chiefs of Edom will be dismayed. The mighty men of Moab trembling will take hold of them. And it goes on and on. Very beautiful. In our tradition, when someone sings, we say, and it may seem very foreign, but uh, each word is actually a cognate uh, with Arabic. I don't know if Egyptian dialect, but certainly a fusha. The zimmare is the mazmur, uh, the, the psalm or the psalmody or the hymn. The mala'ak is our plural for mala'ak or angel. Uh, so may you hear the melodies or the psalms of the angels even our word here is uh masmat sama uh is the i don't know if that i think that's close i know it's close to the hebrew shema i don't know if it's close to the arabic but i assume that it is yeah shema um may you uh, nisma uh, in arabic um nisma. yeah maybe. yeah and melek melek uh, so angels so yeah, yeah i can get I can some hear of that, the psalmody of the angels yeah thank you thank you <laughs> no problem yeah and it just shows you you know how how close the uh the cultures are i think that's a a great introduction because i have always said and i've thought wherever i speak elsewhere and when i teach on my channel and in person the fundamental semitic mindset that the ethiopian church has is less argumentative than I have seen in especially the more Western tradition goes from Greek to Latin to the Anglo-Saxon languages, German and English. And it's almost the language binds or influences and sets the kind of the tendency of the people's mind. Uh, and I don't want to influence you because I don't know fully what you're going to say yet, but I want us to talk about theosis and, you know, what what that has done for good and for bad in in the church and um i i will say just as one precursor without influencing you the divide that i've seen on on certain topics like that and and on other topics it, it goes against the spirit of what i see the ethiopian church which is to for example learn the melodies that you have learned and through the process of discipleship train other people i see far more uh ethiopian church history and i think it's what preserved the church of people dedicating their lives to studying poetry and singing and the scriptures and you know liturgy and then creating disciples to do that in the kind of way that your local community with your grandfather uh saint Archdeacon Habib Georgis, uh, Pope Shenouda, all those people were, you know, making disciples in that same way. Mm -hmm. Your story, that's the story of Ethiopia that I see and that I've heard you share. But yeah, very open. Uh, theosis. <laughs> what, what do you make of it? What What have you seen it do in the, in the Coptic community? So, um, and a very basic, what is it for those who may not know? So the word theosis or theopoesis or um deification or divinization um all these all these terms pretty much tends to mean uh the um the unification with christ 
who is one. Um, and the partaking of his divine grace uh, and to be at, and to attain as high as possible as high as humanly possible um, the divine grace and the divine life uh, or or as theosis says to become God or theopoiesis to be made God um, and we as Oriental Orthodox, I believe, have a very rich tradition of theosis. Ba and, I, and I think this is based off the fact that we are, when we were strongly anti-Chalcedonian, one of the reasons why we rejected Chalcedon was a two-natured Christ would make it impossible for one to receive divine grace. It's as if you're dividing the natures apart rather than un unifying them. Because if Christ is not one, how can we be one with Christ or one in Christ? So now what ended up happening, um, now this is nothing against the Chalcedonians, of course. I'm just putting a polemic out there as to why I, be I believe the theosis is a strong tradition in our church. Um, and you know, I guess part of me coming into this realization in our church um, after, you know, growing from a teenage love of Pope Shenouda to, you know, growing into a more adult, uh, you know, love of, of all the, of the church fathers is, um, is my, is how, how much I realize that and then how much we've kind of lost some of that, um, during the last few centuries, especially during Islamic persecution. And uh, one of the things I wanted to ask was why? You know, why is this such a big controversy, in, especially in our Coptic church? Um, and, uh, and did it begin with Pope Shida or did uh, St. Archdeacon Habib Georgis, did he ever, I, as far as I know, I haven't heard of him ever bringing the issue up. Did he ever talk about it? Is that clear? so? I I don't think he I don't I don't know if he ever talked about it openly. But there's some writings that's been translated into English that actually makes him seem to be like a strong proponent of theosis. Um, for instance, he writes in one of his uh, um, uh, his contemplations that we have to you know kind of like a a bird with its wings. Without its wings, it cannot fly. So our humanity cannot ascend in spirituality without the divine nature. So he speaks to the divine nature as if we have to have it as if it's our wings to help ascend us to the Lord. Um, and I, I kind of find that you know somewhat provocative. Like if I would have said that without mentioning this is by Saint Habib Birgis, some people would consider me, you know, that's very heretical to say, how dare you? consider you you would be connected to the divine nature like a bird on its wings you know with its wings so uh with that said there is a strain of thought in the uh, coptic church that tries to respect the divine nature so much to as to say you know god forbid that I become equal to God by partaking of his divine nature. Only, only the, the three persons of the Trinity can do that. And that, that became a bit problematic in our thinking later on. And those who've inherited that thought later on would be someone like Pope Shenouda and his, and, you know, his main disciple, uh, Metropolitan Beshoy. And they have can, unfortunately, it led to condemnations of anybody who would speak of deification. Uh, even the word deification was considered um, a heretical. And then, if I'm if I'm not mistaken, is the key proponent of that seen like a resurrected view of the older view before? Because I'm assuming you're saying this is an influence of Islam and Islamic theology. Mata al Maskin or Matthew the Poor? Yes. So, Matthew, Abu Mata al Maskin was one of the biggest proponents of uh, theosis or deification in his writings. 
and uh, and he was um, he was attacked a lot in his theology uh, as if you know they attacked him as if he was some sort of Eutychian you know trying to Eutychianize the the all humanity as if we're going to be dissolved into the divine nature and lose our own integrity as humanity um, which you know he did not believe of course the uh, another thing that uh, came about was how he also mentioned um, and I think a lot of it has to do with the Arabic language and you know like in Arabic deification is a problem a problematic word uh, is the uh, the deification of the man is a, is a problem in the Arabic ears because it tends to make people think that you are making yourself equal to God and even in the Western Protestant world, when they hear the word deification, you know, they even think in the same way. They're like, oh, so if you're going to deify man, you're going to make yourself equal to God. That's that's considered heretical. And of course, you know, that's a straw man argument against against deification. Um, so the other the other part of it was the idea of what dwells in the heart of a Christian or in the Christian himself. Is it the Holy Spirit or a grace of the Holy Spirit? Or a, they call it a Holy Spirit. And they use the Coptic word, pi epnevma and u epnevma. And uh, Pope Shenouda, you know, took the latter, you know, and he based, and according to what I understand it, he based it off of philologists' idea uh, of the study of the Bible that whenever the, the, the Coptic scriptures speak of pi epnevma, it speaks of the hypostasis of the Holy Spirit. And whenever they speak of uepnevma, it speaks of the, um, the grace of the Spirit and not the Holy Spirit, the infinite Holy Spirit himself. And so in their minds also, how can the infinite God dwell inside us? It's impossible. To them, that equates, when your hypostasis is united inside somebody, they equated that as hypostatic union. Mm -hmm. So one of the other accusations against the Buna Metta Meskin was he believed that the uh, when the Holy Spirit descended upon the apostles in Pentecost, that it caused the hypostatic union of the Holy Spirit with the apostles. So I, I noticed you switched between languages between, you know, Greco-Coptic and Arabic. Um, when they're using the theology, are they going back and forth? Is there a difference? Because it seems the Semitic language, Arabic, had uh hesitance if not an outright you know being aghast uh at hearing becoming more godlike but right. the uh the numa the, you know these are greek terms that are also used in in coptic is there a, you know i don't know i don't know what the equivalent numa term would be if it would be rucho or or nefesh or something like that but well, is in in coptic you know we've adopted the greek word nevma and actually used it as spirit. I, um, it's, it's actually interesting. I've been trying to find like an ancient Coptic or ancient Egyptian word of what spirit could have meant before we adopted the Greek. And a lot of people don't seem to know. It could be nifi, like nefesh. Mm -hmm. nifi, so nifi could mean breath. Um, uh, that's maybe the closest thing I can think of. Uh, but, um, uh, but yeah, I th I think we've forgotten or don't really. No one really has known what ancient Egyptian term could have been used for the spirit. So instead, we've well, adopted even in the Arabic that comes later. Is the is the Arabic less controversial there between a spirit and the spirit? So it, eventually, like for instance, Metropolitan Bishoy one time gave in his um, lecture, he changed the uh, the the right of the ordination of the priesthood to um so that it can be theologically consonant with his father with his you know spiritual father pope Shenouda. so instead of there's an area in the ordination of, of the presbyter so and the holy spirit uh dwells in this you know priest he said He's like he changes like it shouldn't be that way. It should be Rohan Kodusan. He says a Holy Spirit 
uh, in an adjective, you know, in an adjective sense in Arabic, and not al ruh al qudus which is the the Holy Spirit or the hypostasis. And so that caused a big issue, you know, with people who read the ancient fathers and find that not only is this differentiation didn't exist among the ancient Alexandrian fathers, but it, it was even if, if there was such a differentiation, this was condemned, and it was condemned actually as an historian belief. Because uh, it was believed that Theodore, Mopsuestia, Diodor, and then later on Nestorius actually inherited this idea that the infinite God is impossible for the infinite God to dwell in, in humanity. And therefore, uh, there's a difference between uh, the grace of the Holy Spirit dwelling in someone and a Holy Spirit and, and the Holy Spirit. Um, and they would say the same thing about the word of God inside Jesus Christ. So, uh, and that's why you get some people. Um, uh, have accused of Pope Shenouda as having an historian sacramental theology, um, despite the fact that he is also, you know, uh, publicly professed Miaphysite Christology. So that's that. That's part of the problem. Is that this? You want to? We've an, inherited this idea that we've wanted to separate us far from the divinity so that we can protect the honor of the divine nature. Um, and that led to the rejection of theosis and deification uh, by certain people in the Coptic church. Um, unfortunately, chiefly among them was Pope Shenouda. And, you know, when you say that, and when I say that, that causes a problem because we've held the Pope at such a high pedestal, even to the point of some people, you know, spreading stories about his sainthood and about miracles associated with him. And, you know, for me to say that the Pope Shudu was a human and could have made a mistake is a big no-no. It's like we've inherited a mini papal infallibility for Pope Shudu himself. And, uh, uh, you know, it seems to me eventually we're starting to make men's still is going to be an issue, but we're waiting for everyone to completely forget about the situation like two or three generations later, as if this controversy never existed. And then we're going to, we're probably going to go back to teaching theosis as the ancient fathers have taught. Yeah. And um, uh, there's so many different directions we can go with this, but I'm just very curious in terms of his predecessor and his successor, uh, Pope Kyrillos the sixth, and then, Pope Theodoros II, have they ever said anything to your knowledge about these topics? So Pope Kyrillos VI is, is, is a very interesting character. Um, so he uh, he's considered you know, a huge follower of St. Isaac the Syrian. Mm -hmm. <laughs> a man of the Church of the East. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, uh, <laughs> as much as you know, some of us might not like to admit it. Yes, you know he was, and and I'm sure he re he read the uh, Chalcedonian translation of his uh, of his sermons, and that what that's what led him to become uh, a uh, a monk and a very devout monk at that, um, and a wonder worker. With that said, you know, and, and I you know as a side note. St. Isaac the Syrian is kind of unique in the fact that I think he does have a lot of theosis in his sermons, which is interesting. Um, so, it, but that's, that. I guess that's a side note that needs more research. Yeah, I want, I want to, that's going to be my next question for you. I, I have another question for you around that. Uh, but in, in any case, you know, he, he's also was a strong supporter of the Sunday school movement and he had he have both sides that were devoted to him, both those that were uh, of the you know later on to become the Shenudian school and those of the Metta school. Um, and yeah, in, in a way, it's because of Pope Carlos that both of these two men have become huge in the church, huge leaders in the church. Uh, so that's so. 
but it's but from what I understand, it could be that Pope Prolos can be on the side of theosis, but we're not 100% sure. We do hit one of his disciples, who was sadly excommunicated from the church and then later reinstated at the very end of his life, was uh, Dr. George Babewi. Um, he was a convert into the Coptic Church from Judaism and uh, was uh, later on would become uh, a, a, a uh, a professor in, I believe, Cambridge uh, School of Theology with the permission of Pope Carlos. And before the Pope Carlos became Pope, when he was Father Mina the Hermit, you know, that, that was um, Dr. George considered him a spiritual father. So, um, and Dr. George would share stories with us when we would listen to his uh, YouTube videos, how the, um, uh, how he was pro theosis and that he definitely um, would encourage his children. Part of his prayer rule is to chant the Sali, the Psalis in the midnight prayers um, as part of their prayer rule. And it's very interesting because he took a liturgical focus on understanding the spiritual spirituality of the church. And there are, you know, if you, if you look close enough, there are um, cases of understanding theosis, especially in the Friday Theotokia, where we chant, he took what is ours and gave us what is his. Uh, so th that's like the biggest mantra of uh, theosis in our uh, Coptic hymnology. Um, sad to say later on, you know, doc, you know when Pope Shenouda became Pope, uh, after a few years of him becoming Pope, uh, differences became irreconcilable between him and Dr. George Babeli. And then Dr. George Babeli ended up joining the Russian Orthodox Church, and his spiritual father would become Metropolitan Anthony Bloom. Mm -hmm. So, so in, in a way, Dr. George Babeli... Anthony Bloom has a book on prayer, and so does uh, Father Mata al -Maskin. Yeah, yeah, which is interesting. Um, and uh, there is a, uh, um, I, have, I have, one of my friends uh, was able to, you know, it was much closer to Dr. George um, than I can be. Uh, and he went through the library of Dr. George Babawi. And one of the books he opened, he saw a handwritten note by Abu Nemet al Meskin. And he gave high praise to Dr. George Babawi as one of the greatest theologians in the church. Um, Pope Teladros, out of um, out of the kindness of his heart, um, told a uh, the bishop and I think the priests in Indiana to go and bring and allow Dr. George to come back and commune in the Coptic Orthodox Church. And then when he passed away, they gave him a, fu a Coptic funeral as well. So you know, um, the last year. He, he actually returned back to the Coptic Church with, without controversy, of course. It's not without controversy. You know, Pope Tuadros was attacked publicly by many bishops for doing that. Um, and they always, they, they said, you know, uh, there was one famous bishop, I think Pope uh, Emba ben, ben Yamin in Egypt, where he says, what Pope Tuadros did is going to be between him and God, but the decree of Pope Shenouda stands, you know, in his mind. He was still the excommunicated uh, George Bavelli. Um In any case, uh, as sad as these stories are, uh, it gives us an understanding of this controversy that's happened. And I do think my hypothesis is because of Islamic influence. Um, and this is not something unique to the Coptic Church. We're just we just happen to be late in the game. Um, even the Chalcedonian Arab churches have suffered with the uh, theology of theosis. Um, there is um, Alexander Trieger has an article about the uh, about patristics in Arabic, and uh, some of the first church fathers that were translated in Arabic. And they were by Chalcedonian, um, de uh, there was like a Chalcedonian deacon of the, of the, um, of the Church of Antioch.
that started the translation process of Saint Gregory the Theologian. Saint Gregory the Theologian is 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 someone who's very provocative in his theology. But when it came to the word deification, this Chalcedonian Arab, instead of writing to Eluh, which is the direct translation, he wrote it as contemplation mm -hmm. of God. And any understanding and any word of deification in in the translation was understood as as uh, the process that that Christ went through between him and the Father, and not man, any other man. So deification was sort of like a relationship between the Father and the Son, uh, in the understanding of these Arabic translations. And I think these Ar these translations led to this loss of the theology of theosis eventually in all the arab churches uh so uh that is my under that's my hypothesis of course when you know you start to read the church fathers of old in their original that's when you know people like abu namat al uh came along with their with his disciples and started to um uh, teach theosis. And then there are also those who were disciples of Pope Shenouda and then who um, will not mention anything negative of Pope Shenouda, will always mention something positive, but then will also go around and teach theosis as well. And then there are some who will say, yes, deification was uh, there in the church fathers, but the way they mean deification is sort of a moral thing, to make you more virtuous, to um, resist the corruption of the flesh and things like that. And you know, some of those are trying to play both fields, but then they lose the essence, the ontological understanding of deification only make it a moralistic sense. Yeah, it's it's very fascinating. Just to put my cards on the table, I, I didn't want to turn it into, you know, definitely a debate. I mostly want to hear your take and your experience. I probably would fall into that moralistic camp um, uh, more than the ontological camp in this. And I think it's uh, a lot to do with definitions, especially as we travel across a lot of these languages. I, I see the Islamic influence, and I think it's a very good hypothesis, to be honest. I uh, we don't know, but I think I think that's a very strong hypothesis, just from from what I have seen. And it seems like there is this Arabic thought, which is in the larger camp of Semitic thought. And I would say that it's probably more similar to the Syriac thought and and the Ge'ez and the Amharic thought. And it seems like there's this Greek thought, which is very patristic oriented, but that the patristics that it's oriented on are very focused on, for example, the Greek fathers like the ones that were in Alexandria and the ones that were in Cappadocia. Yeah. And if we were to examine only the writings of the Greek fathers in Cappadocia and in Alexandria, I, I think I think that would be right. You know, um, Athanasius and Cyril and um, the Gregories and Basil the Great. And I think that would be right. Uh, interestingly enough, um, I think there's also this other tradition uh, of Antioch, of which John Chrysostom in the Greek language is the biggest uh, proponent in, in in Greek. But and then maybe Theodor of Mopoestia, who whom you said, you know, we actually use his Psalms interpretation in the Ethiopian Church. Mm. Um, and uh, doesn't mean we accept everything he's ever said, but we, but our Psalm interpretation is from Theodor of Mopoestia. Uh, but everyone else from that tradition kind of wrote in Syriac. And then later, a lot of those writings are translated into Arabic. And then from Syriac to Arabic, it was uh, through a couple different times, they were translated into the Ethiopian languages. And so I, I'm thinking that Pope Kyrillos's generation and uh, the, the sixth and uh, Pope Shenouda's generation may have read this Syriac work in Arabic translation, in addition to their own Arabic theology, where you have Matal Maskin and George Badawi and all and, uh, and more modern people who are learning Greek and are reading the Greek fathers. So it's it's very fascinating um, because my view comes a lot from my Hebrew teacher, Father Paul Tarazi, who is a Palestinian in the Greek communion. Mm -hmm. And 
the way he talks about it a lot is that our project is restoring humanity. It's like David told his son, Soliman, whom you are a namesake of, uh, be a human, you know, be a human. And so in trying to become a human rather than uh, a superhuman. And mm -hmm. so it's interesting, the ontological versus the moral. Um, I wonder how much overlap there is between these ideas of deification and, and theosis on a moral level or a, or an ontological level, because everything that you have said thus far, I think I would plainly agree with. But sometimes some people, when they, they begin to add other language, other vocabulary, they begin introducing energies and wills and all sorts of things that have never heard of. And it's like uh, you agree to something and you write a contract and then uh, they keep going and the fine print has all this other stuff. And so I hadn't heard you use some of the language that normally startles me, but I have heard other people like it's like the deeper they get into it, they introduce more and more terms uh, that you you need some sort of proper understanding of greek to even understand oftentimes they're transliterated from the greek they're not even in english some of them mm -hmm. you know uh it might be like the word numa and then it becomes like pneumatological or something like that you know that's not quite it but something like that so i don't know is if there has been has there ever been um someone's presentation of theosis that was ever too much for you and you thought oh no i'm in a slightly different camp or uh has every presentation of it that you've presented been the same way that that you have said it? Well, initially in my in my life, um, I I was actually very snooty in thought because that's all I've ever read when I was a teenager going into uh, adulthood. Um, and then when I started to read about the controversy, well, first off, I one of the things that you know, got me started and is, is trying to figure out, well, what makes one orthodox and what doesn't, you know, I went from thinking of myself as Coptic, then I was like, okay, we have sister churches, we should also, you know, um, uh, celebrate the diversity of the sister churches and not just think things just in Coptic. And then that went from, okay, but what are these other people that call themselves orthodox, the Greeks and the Russians? And so that led me to read about the history, the Chalcedonian controversy. And then that led me to read also into other, you know, intricacies of theology. And then that led me to read about theosis and deification. And I was like, what's that? And initially when I read about it, I was like, that sounds to me like I'm going to become equal to God. And that it, it's, it, it was, uh, it was a pushback. I was like, it sounds very uh, provocative. But then I read the same provocative terminology in the fathers. Mm -hmm. um, and and to take, get back to your point at the Syrian tradition, the, even this, you know, it seems like the Greek tradition tends to be a lot more unified, but there's a lot of Syrian traditions. It's not just one. So you have, um, yeah, you have Diodor and Theodore and Nestorius. Um, and John Chrysostom is like a huge question mark, it's sort of like, you know, <laughs> Kind of like the transition between the moral and the uh, and the and theosis, where he's he's not being explicit, but there's something implicit about him. And then there is um, there is someone like Ephraim the Syrian, mm -hmm. um, who's also you know very provocative in his language of deification and theosis. Uh, the terms weren't there, but you know he would mention things like you know the the idea, the language that we got in the Coptic hymnology. He took what is ours and gave us what is his comes from Ephraim, the Syrian. And, um, you know, later on, the anti Chalcedonian fathers like Philoxenus of Nabu, uh, Jacob of Siru, um, St. Severus of Antioch, although one can argue that he was m more Greek than he is Syrian, mm -hmm. uh, is, uh, you know, that tradition becomes part of a Syriac tradition that is pro theosis and pro. Um, uh, so, um, so with, with with all that that I'm just I'm learning about, I also wanted to you know I, I guess you can call me an ecumenist in that uh, I uh, as much as I have an appreciation for anti-Chalcedonian 
history and um, his contribution to my theology, uh, I tended to also see that the Chalcedonians the same in theology. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, if when you dig deeper from all the term terminological differences that we have, um, for uh, and I want to extend the same to the Church of the East. <laughs> I want to, yeah. and it depends. It depends on whether they adopt Isaac the Syrian strictly, mm -hmm. um, and uh, and maybe uh, you know some some of his thoughts. Because I, I don't know if there's a different way you can interpret Theodore and Theodore. If there's a, if you can interpret Theodore and Theodore in such a way that you also the Church of the East can have a theology of theosis in in its church, not just moral but ontologically, then I think there's also no difference in theology between us and the Church of the East. Um. As far as I'm aware, they don't believe Christ is two persons, so I, I'll give them that. And I'm willing to even extend that if they're interpreting the stories as, as not interpreting as two persons, fine. Even though, you know, it, it would be difficult for me to, you know, seeing the debates and seeing his writings to accept that. Uh, so, but in any case, initially, yes, I was. I felt theosis meant equality with God. And then that became, then I realized quickly that became a red herring. Because if you're going to say you're going to partake of, or you're going to, um, you're going to become or be made into, that means that you were not that before. And you could, and the church fathers were very clear that the integrity of your created self will never change. So that's one thing that I've learned. No matter what language you use, whether you partake of the divine nature or, divine, or partake of the divine essence or you're partaking of the divine energies, all that, all from what I saw, whether no matter what language you use, is that you are protecting the fact that the divine nature is always going to stay, stay divine, uncreated, and the created is always going to stay created. But that doesn't stop from there being a, a communion between both. Did I lose you? No, no, I'm still here. Oh, I heard okay. You. Yeah, I, the, it kind of froze a little bit in my end. No, no, um, no, we're still here. We're still here. Yeah, the screen froze a little, but we still hear you. And if if we want to, I think I think this has been an important discussion, and I thank you for having it um, with me for people to see you know, a calm, I think both of us have expressed, uh, oh, your visuals are great now, uh, a very calm way of discussing differences with all these different great fathers whom we respect and these larger historic traditions uh, within Christianity. For me, like you, um, whether we call it being ecumenical or having a great veneration or respect of every historic Christian tradition, um you know west and east of us you know but not too west uh, <laughs> uh you know I, I have a great respect for those venerable traditions as well i usually refer to them linguistically right the greek tradition and the east syriac and uh you know it's not that i don't like our russian brothers i'll hit them with the Hustos Moskres. i had a delivery man the other day actually and uh his uh his name was uh, some form of the word uh, Dimitri. It was like Dimitros or something. I was like, oh, he's he's either a Mediterranean or Slavic. And I saw the picture. I said, he looks Slavic. I'm not sure. He could be Ukrainian. He could be Russian. He could be Serbian. He could be anything. Yeah. But I, as he was walking away, I said, Christos Voskresi, which is the Christos Anesti, or Christ is risen. And yeah. he turned around and he said, Vostino Voskresi. Vostino Voskresi, <laughs> <he was> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you know, a funny story. Back in 2015, around this time, I uh, went to the whole... Um, to Jerusalem in mm -hmm. Holy Week. The church and, of Jerusalem. Yeah, yeah. The, and uh, it was a very memorable moment. I'll never forget it. And on my way back, it was Easter Sunday, and I had to take a connecting flight in Moscow. And so I decided, you know, I was I was going to uh, buy some sausage, you know, to, to break the fast now, now that it's Easter. And, uh, 
you know, be on my way back home to New Jersey and, and celebrate with my family. And the, and there was a nice lady, so I decided to say, Christos was crazy. And then she smiled. She's like, uh, you know, uh, I appreciate the sentiment, but I am Muslim. <laughs> 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 she must have been Chechen or Dagestani. So, probably. <laughs> That's so funny. She was a very sweet lady. <laughs> oh, man. Well, hopefully someone gives you a Vostino Voskresi one day. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, so I meant that to say I, I wanted to encourage other people to have theological discussions in a calm way that's very respectful as well and kind of changing gears a little bit as we as we close out i did want to touch a little bit of, on on you being a, a physician i don't know if your favorite verse is physician heal thyself it's not a necessarily a positive verse but it's one that i've i've loved uh, a lot in the gospel of luke but wow. um also without getting booted off of uh, youtube if we can discuss uh, during the um during this recent plague let's uh, say um were there multiple approaches or a single approach to how people are going to do the liturgy in terms of, um, you know, whether there will be a liturgy at all, how many people show up, who's invited, do you register, do you just show up, um, do you need to, you know, have a shot or a jab before you show up, um, uh, chalice usage, you know, I got a lot of questions from people. Uh, one of my Sunday school students, who's an adult a few years older than me, asked me point blank, are you guys going to sanitize the spoon between each usage? And I couldn't help but laughing because not because I have any particular opinion that is strong in either direction, but I know the opinion of the church. <laughs> and I was like, look, man, <laughs> whatever my opinion is, and whatever your opinion is, they're not going to do that 300 times. You know, again, like I said, not necessarily everyone. You have more communicants than we do, but we have a, a pretty large amount of communicants at our church compared to a lot of other parishes. So anything you could say about that? And if you were, I don't know if you were a consulted in any official or unofficial capacity because you are a physician. I No, I wasn't consulted, but I, um, uh, I do appreciate what our parishes you know, we're trying to do, you know, we, we weren't trying to go against governmental um, uh, restrictions or, you know, what they wanted to do. Certainly, it felt, it, it, it was very difficult that, you know, the, the one year we weren't able to um, pray like the Easter liturgy or the, or the, uh, the Christmas liturgy. Um, and uh, that we all had to stay at home and just watch it uh on the uh, or from a streaming site but at the same time whenever there was uh, during that time they did have uh registration um to come in now unfortunately sometimes people would over register and then some of them would never show up and then the priests got very annoyed at that so there was a way in which you know some priests were like look i know we say to register but between you and me you want to come to church, just come and partake of the liturgy. Uh, and then we've had ways in which people would sit in the in the benches in, in a uh, socially distanced way. Um, and the priest would commune, come towards you. Instead of you come towards the the, uh, the body and blood, they, they would actually go towards the uh, communicant uh, during that it's not unheard of we we've done that always for sick people sometimes we have a sick person who can't make it inside the sanctuary someone yeah. comes them in a vehicle they might be in a wheelchair and we go into their their i've been into cars sometimes yeah. i have uh, we've saved some and we've traveled to hospitals yeah absolutely so it's not it, it, it that's that's not controversial there was no such thing as sanitizing the spoon but there was in some parishes what they tried to do is that you know they would sort of like have you uh you know lower yourself a little bit and just open your mouth really wide so they can drop the body and then they would also do the same thing for the blood drop the spoon so that it doesn't touch the lips um as before uh so that was the best thing that the coptic church would do uh that uh, during that time the um the syrian church i've been to a syrian parish in which they tinctured the 
blood into the body, and then they put it on the hand, and then you would you right away eat it rather than uh, having it being fed. Um, uh, so it's I don't have any objection. Um, I know that there is this issue. How how can one get sick if they partake of the communion? You should have more faith. Um, but I, you know, I say it's it, it is possible that one can still get sick. You know, if it's uh, by transmission. You know, God is not going to destroy viruses. He created them just as much as He created you and me. I mean, so um, so if you know, if we get sick by it, it's it's according to his will. Uh, and if and the question is, if you're willing to take that risk to partake of Christ, then go for it. Uh, that's that's my take on it. You know, I don't take this idea of you'll never get sick if you partake of the Eucharist. No, people do get sick. It's and it doesn't matter. You know, there's no guilt or innocence in people getting sick. Getting sick is just a part of our physiology. Uh, I, you know, as uh, somebody who worked, I was a family medicine resident in the Bronx, um, working in the front lines, and I got very sick for about a month after doing chest compressions on every patient that I can to try to save them or give them a saving chance. And I've seen people die left and right because of the pandemic. And it was very tough. Uh, and, yeah, and I knew, you know, going into this that I would, uh, you know, I, there was a risk to my life. I've, we've had some residents that sort of were squeamish. They're like, no, 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 I don't want to go in there. I'm too scared. Mm -hmm. So I was like, all right, you know, then why'd you choose this profession? I, I, I get very judgmental to those who, you know, are not willing to take the risk and run in there. Um, so, uh, so just as much as one is willing to take the risk to be uh, one with our Lord, so is one to, willing to take the risk to go and heal the most infirm of our uh, of our brothers and sisters who are made in the image and likeness of our Lord. I mean. No, very beautifully said, uh, brother. So um, we've definitely discussed some darker topics as we close out more properly. Um, I, again, I think it's a dead horse that's been beaten well enough, but uh, the, the, the distinction that some try to make between science and faith, I'm always trying to destroy. That's why my program is the philosophy of art and science. And I appreciate men of science like yourself, um, I'm a very amateur man of science. I've delved too much into the humanities over the past decade and over the past few years, been learning more and more uh, of the STEM that I was better at as a child, but strayed from in my adulthood. And so I appreciate men of science like you who are also men of faith, whether it's more generic to people in STEM um, who may have any doubts if they, if they do, or mm -hmm. if it's to up and coming physicians who are also in the faith if you have any words of uh, encouragement or uh, i love uh words of ad admonishment and exhortation too if you want to rebuke them too so <laughs> that's also good so any sort of uh closing thoughts uh, whether encouragement or rebuke to uh, people uh, trying to become doctors and nurses or anything in stem um i treat it like uh you know we are all when, when we all have the holy spirit that uh we are all chrismated to become little Christs. We are made priests, prophets, and kings. Um, in the profession, I take it as a sense of priesthood that the patient that I am seeing is the altar and that I give all my reverence and all my respect uh, and treatment to that altar of the Lord um, to the best of my ability. And you know, I'll have my assistants, the nurses, who are kind of like the deacons for me, and uh, uh, you know, there, and there so were deacons and chanters. There's so many yeah, ranks of nurses. <laughs> so many, so many ranks in the healthcare professions. Uh, and so, I and I think this goes to any profession, any profession that you that you do. If you're doing it for the glory of Christ, 
then the work that that you are going into to treat that as the altar and you are the priest of the lord offering it up to the lord and uh you know you're doing your best in your train and your uh, in your training um to do what is right before the lord and to hope that you know you've done everything you can and now lord you know this is this is my offer to you in my work wonderful thank you so much uh mina subdeacon and mina for joining me on this program thank you so much deacon and uh hopefully we'll uh we'll continue this discussion another time